very quite well over the last couple of days. Um, and I can tell you, the man has an incredible sense of humor. Um, for someone who is also running a Goliath of a, of a business is um, just incredibly genuine and um, authentic and very passionate about people. Um, I think, um, you know, over the past couple of days, learning a little bit about Barry, just purely what he has accomplished has, um, has given me a lot of inspiration and, and particularly hearing his story, which you will hear a lot more tonight in some detail. Um, you know, starting a business with like 50,000 Rand to building it into a Goliath of a business of over a billion Rand in sales is nothing short of quite spectacular, but it takes a lot of hard work. Um, takes a lot of dedication and it takes, you know, a certain specific way of doing business. And I think what was inspiring for me was just the manner in which um, Barry has been conducting his business, um, which hopefully you will find just as inspiring. Um, so yeah, Barry, I don't know if you just want to say a quick hello before we, we jump into it. Or... Yeah, so hello, everyone. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm back in Miami. I was in Cape Town for, for a few weeks, uh, reconnected and was very lucky, as Brenna said, to, to see her at the restaurant. I just want to tell a quick joke um, just before we start the proceedings, just, uh, you know, maybe my humor can come through. So the family, we immigrated 4th of December 2018 to uh, Newport Beach, to, to Irvine. And the very first day, it was like 35 degrees, and I wanted to take the kids for ice cream. So I asked the concierge, it, it must my easiest South African accent, I said, sir, where can I get an ice cream? So I don't know the names of shops or whatever. So he sent me to the CVS. So I quickly ran with the CVS. I keep the kids at the hotel. I say, can I get four ice creams? Obviously, I'm the fourth kid at 45. So the, the person at the CVS looked at me like I was mad. He said, sir, this is a chemist. We don't sell ice cream. So now I'm in a huff and a puff and it's, it's hot and I'm walking back. So I say to the concierge, I go, Mr. Concierge, I asked you for an ice cream. Why did you send me to the pharmacy? He said, oh, Barry, I thought you asked for ice cream. So, uh, you know, with the accent, uh, many more stories and maybe I'll have time later to, to tell you a joke or two. Uh, there's a slight difference between ice cream and ice cream. So... Uh, I've never made that mistake again. So, <laughs> thanks, Brad. Um, cool. So, I think just um, before we get into it as well, I just wanted to to let you know, um, as far as the structure of tonight is concerned, we'll, we'll go through the discussions, and that uh, we're going to leave about fifteen minutes at the end for any kind of questions that you have for Barry um, that you want to put to him. Okay. So we're just going to kick off with a little short video. Hello. Mm, good evening, agent. You've landed yourself in some hot water with all this taking over the world. Mm, we try. We're the future Uber or Airbnb of the mobile devices industry. Who's the we you're referring to? BBD. That's Blue Beat Digital. And if you want to know, you're going to have to use your imagination. I mean, enough with the imagination. Just go on. Imagine a company that pairs mobile devices with prepaid SIMs and sells them door to door with no... Mm, middleman, right? You got it. Mm. The mobile operator does not have to hold any stock, which means it's an off-balance sheet business. So imagine 25,000 agents pushing a mobile operator into an ecosystem with annuity-based products. Oh, like any operator? Focus, buddy. Yeah. Imagine a company that's redefining the mobile industry by creating a legacy of wealth for future generations. The next thing you're going to say is we've arrived. We've arrived. Now stop imagining. Oh, and we do deals in less than 30 seconds. Now, if you'll excuse me, that place is to be. All right, so, so even though you, you might have seen that there's business at the top and a party at the bottom, there's a very real message um, in that video too. And um, 
I think to kick off, Barry, what's um, coming out of that video? I mean, what you, you built this incredible business, um, but it must have started somewhere. What made you start the business? What made you want to get into, into this field and, and into this market? So, uh, very interesting question. I started my business career at uh, Simba, and, and while I was probably the only Jew, I was one of two Jewish employees there, and uh, it, it's not a job for a nice Jewish boy from Hertzler with a sporting background to go spend a, a few months on the trucks in the informal market. But I saw a gap that the informal market, if you can bridge your knowledge of the formal market and get products to the informal market, it is the easiest business in the world to do. So there's no, you don't do terms. It's a, it's a cash business. You know, you go there, we drop off the chips, they pay for us. There's a shop on every corner. Every tuck shop is a shop. Um, all the foreign nationals were there. And right there and then, I said, one day when I could save up some money, I, I mean, I moved to Johannesburg. I went to work for a company that was in telecoms. And my thing was when I had enough money and that enough money was 50,000 Rand, as you said earlier, I decided that I got to use my knowledge and my ability to, to bring product to the people rather than the people who can't travel 60 miles to a shop. We went deep rural. I saw all the gaps. And I knew this was my calling. My calling was to bring product so that the people weren't ripped off, give it to them for free, give it to them for cheap, and empower the foreign nationals um, who later became my marketing department, my voice, and give them an opportunity to make money. And I saw a gap. No one was supplying the, the SIM cards. They were all supplying them to a wholesaler or a, Vodaf a Vodacom shop. So my gap was, don't let the people come to you, go to the people. Like in the video, no middlemen. So I developed informal distribution and, and we brought products from China. We, we sold them at cost. We, we allowed the entrepreneurs to, to, to make money. And my whole thing is about empowering people, letting them make money. People like making money from people that they, and doing business with people that they like. But at the same time, they were doing my starter packs my drivers were earning commission. They went further out. I didn't move the goalposts. And every time they earned money, I allowed them to earn more money. So there was a gap bridging the formal and informal market. And that's what allowed me today to, to probably create the foundation. So I say, when you're building a big business, you need two things. Actually, you need three. You need integrity, you need time, and you need patience. So... This Bluebeat Digital, which we'll talk about later, this is 22 years of, of seven days a week, 18 hours a day. Overnight success, it doesn't happen. It's 1% uh, luck and 99% perseverance. Like I grew up, I had no money, I had no network. I moved to Johannesburg, I knew no people. Uh, no one even picked me up at, uh, at, at the airport. And then uh, I just went out and I did it. You know, it's, uh, it's the ability to go out and to back yourself. 50 grand wasn't a lot of money. So I couldn't get it wrong. So it, it was a challenge for me to, to go empower the people and let them let everyone make money. So I say, if one person makes money, it's not a partnership. So all my shops, all my drivers, all my distributors, I partnered up with them. Uh, I make a little bit of money from a lot of people, but from a small thing, and I'm from Cape Town, I've managed to go build a global business and test myself in the hardest markets in the world. So it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Absolutely. I think there's there's a lot in that um, <clears throat> that you shared. I mean, you know, even from starting, you know, the big buzzword at the moment is around doing business with purpose. And it's something that you've already, you know, that you led with. Um, <clears throat> making sure people are benefiting and providing them a platform at the same time in which they are able to expand and grow and feed their families, really. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's, it's really big, you know, really courageous and, and quite risky to go into the informal market, you know, not knowing anything about it. But, you know, from what I've seen and, and heard as well, once you get your boots on the ground and actually go into trade, that's really where you learn. Um, as opposed to trying to figure it out and research it and theoreticize it behind a desk. It always 
from what I've seen and, and my experience, it always makes the big difference is going in, speaking to people, shaking their hands, understanding what it is that they need, building the offering and the business around that. Um, you know, you spoke about um, time is one of the things. And, and obviously, you know, getting, getting to where you're at now takes a lot of sacrifice and seven days a week. What is, what is a typical day in the life of Barry? Uh, I'm going to answer this question and it's probably going to shock the world. I don't work. I have fun. So when you do what you do, it's the best business in the world. So I would do my job for free. So my day is busy. So let me take you through it. So my, my day starts the night before with the planning before. So in my head, I take 10 or 15 minutes, I take a pen, I take a piece of paper, I methodically work out how I'm going to do 60 tasks that the normal person can only do 10. So by the time I go to bed and I switch off my phone and I'm planning for tomorrow, so for example, my Monday night, my Monday 7 o'clock starts on Sunday 6 o'clock. So I've spent an hour preparing my whole week, my whole day. So every minute of every day i plan where i'm going to be so if i need to book a flight and i don't have a pa i do it myself i know i'll have half an hour in an uber for the day so my day starts out pretty early help getting the kids ready and whatever then i check my phone i do not own a computer i'm probably the only person in the world that doesn't have a computer a lot i had one in in orange county and when they showed me the the keyboard and the computer, the technology had changed because I hadn't used one in nine years. So my day will be answering 50 or 60 WhatsApp calls from around the world and putting out any fire before the fire starts. So my advice to you is don't, when there's a fire, put out the fire. Don't wait till the end of the day. So I tackle the hardest tasks and within about 10 or 15 minutes, everyone has direction, my teams around the world. I have direction. And then I know what to do. So a WhatsApp will only get you so far. So we solve the problems and we have a plan and everyone knows what to do. Then I'll put my ear pods in, which I recommend to everyone. And I will do calls for the next two hours. So the fact that I can go for a two hour walk in the morning and I can do my calls and I'll have five or six people and I can walk fast and I can, I can jog and I can do my calls and I can stress. And it's not stress. I don't stress. I can stretch and get through the day. I've done my exercise, which is the most important thing for me in the day. So when people ask me how successful was my day, the more I exercise and the less I focus on work, that is how successful my day is. Because health is the new wealth. And, and I will do, I get through two hours of exercise and I have my calls and no one knows. And then I come home, I'll shower, I'll eat a healthy breakfast. And then I'll start working. I don't work in an office. I'll go to a coffee shop. I'll take a pen. I'll take a piece of paper. I'll look around. I'll see pictures. I love the ocean. That's why I live in, in Boca and in Miami. I will go sit by a park in a, in a thing after I've had a cup of coffee or, or a healthy fruit juice uh, with lots of vitamins. And then I start planning what is my next move. Like I will plan 10 steps ahead of my competitors because I have to. I, I don't have hundreds of people. I have a very, very small team. And, and I say less is more. Having a small team, I sp speak every day to everyone in my team at least two or three times a day. Sometimes it's a one minute call, sometimes it's a 10 minute. And I do the same thing with my, my dealers, small, medium, and large. All I want to know is that there's a mentor, someone cares, and by leading by example and really caring, like if, if I have a staff member that has a family problem, I will help them solve their problem. So everything I do is, is not to project manage my people, is, is to help them and to get them in a better place. And the same with my dealers. And then I will do all my work. I'll, I'll go through four or five emails on my phone. And then... Uh, I will carry on talking to the dealers and I'll de deal with the mobile operators and I'll look at new products and I'll call China. And then when I come home, I'm so methodical with my day, I try to put my phone away. I try. Most of the times I get it 
right, by putting it upside down. And then I'm present with the family. But I don't watch TV. I, do, I try to read what I can. But I'm saying I'm never chasing my tail. So if you plan your day and you know, and I take a piece of paper, by the end of that day, that piece of paper, all the ticks are done. And then I'm, I don't carry anything to the next day. So I have three young daughters um, in a foreign country with foreign rules. So I try to read up for about an hour because the Americans are very, very clever, but they're not going to catch me much. And then I spend my time with my family. We try to eat a nice supper. We try to talk to each other. And, and then the family will go to bed. And then I'll carry on for three, four, five hours into the night till one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. Like whatever has to be done, I do it. Sometimes I'll have an early night, sometimes I won't. But when I go to sleep, every objective has done or I don't go to sleep. That's, um, that's great advice. And I think, um, yeah, you know, planning, failure to plan is, is really planning to fail. Um, I can speak from experience as well. Not, not having a structured day um, makes for a very chaotic day. And I think, you know, hearing what you're, what you're sharing and speaking about is that there actually is time in the day to do everything that needs to get done. The rest is just excuses, really. If we can have the time to do the exercise, um, attend to work, speak to people. I really do love the way that you, you spoke about being accessible, really, to your staff and to your suppliers um, and have bringing that human element into it, that empathetic element, um, which I think really does start separating a, you know, a CEO and, you know, from a leader, um, someone that's actually accessible and has, has some kind of, uh, has empathy. And I, I really like the way you're talking about the structure and preparation, anticipating the problem before it actually happens and trying to put it out. Um, and I've certainly seen a lot of people changing the way that they've been doing business and changing their lifestyle since COVID hit all of us and understanding what are some of the more important things other than just work, like family, self, you know, self-respect and, and health um, around that. And I think that will then lead me to my next question too, because coming out of COVID, I mean, obviously there was also a lot of cellular usage over the COVID period, but is there anything that you did or was there any effect that COVID might have had on your business? And, and what did you do to, you know, for, without sounding too cliche, but pivot? Was there a need to pivot with your business too? Okay, so very interesting question. When COVID hit, so one of my successes in my life is everyone calls me Barry the Oracle. So generally I'm three or four months or because I'm in the heart of the market, five or six months ahead of everyone. I knew there was a problem. So we had a meeting with my team and I said, let's bring in PPE. You know, no one in America could bring in PPE. Everyone was ripping each other off. So I decided then and there, if you're going to do anything in the world for business, make sure you do good. So I have global sourcing out of China. I delayed my virtual mobile network that I was creating in America. And it was the right decision at the time because all the mobile shops were, were, were closing down. I had 39 people in a foreign country, in a startup. The RAND went from 14 to 20. I, I was financing it out of, as we said, out of my South African business. So I decided to build a business purely out of good. And we brought in maybe 30, 40 million, I don't even know, products. Uh, PPE products from masks to face shields to hand sanitizer, everything. And we sold them. It was slightly above cost, but we lost money on, on the exercise. But we built the most incredible brand. So I was up 20 hours of the night. I was dealing with South Africa. I was dealing with America. I was dealing with China. The fact that I was in America, I had the best advantage because my core business was in South Africa. So we were six months ahead of the curve. So whatever was coming to America, I could prepare my team and no one, none of my other competitors could compare the team. So I told them there's going to be a lockdown. Let's invest in our customers. You know, let's invest in our agents. Let's play annual bonuses because everyone's, everyone's loved one's going to lose a job. I saw it in front of me. I mean, I went from 39 people to, to 15 people in, in my startup here. And uh, we had to do what we had to do to survive. But people work seven days a week. 
Uh, the one Sunday we got out, I don't know, 10, 15,000 products. And, and our message was, you only have your name once. So whatever you promise, do properly. So we got masks out the same day. Um, there was a girl in our year group that I met the other day. Her name is it's Joanne Hoberman Bart. Brenda knows her. She didn't even know that she uh, bought masks from Ruby Digital. But when I met her, she said, Barry, I'm in Miami. You're in California. I ordered masks. They arrived. And they arrived the next day. And they were real. And they were a third of the price than everyone. So just by following meticulously my American business, by doing good on the PPE, we built the most incredible brand. We came number one on Amazon because we would outsell everyone. We made a little bit of money. There's 400 million people in America and they all have money. So I don't think there was one zip code in America that I didn't sell PPE to. And as a result, my batteries, my non-core products, my batteries increased, my SIM cards increased. So by doing good and changing the way you do business, everyone wants to do business with me again. So I say, just do good and, and planning and investing in people. So some of the mobile operators that invested their money and kept the deal, now I'm their biggest customer. So it's having integrity and not doing a short-term decision. And I invested in all my dealers. I gave them double petrol money. I gave them money for moss. I gave them free stuff. I empowered everyone to go through a war zone. I gave them the tools to make sure that anything that was thrown at them, we organized them essential service passes. We kept the offices open. We made sure everyone got SIM cards. And we just navigated it so easily because I was prepared. I didn't use an excuse that I'm phoning China and I can sleep two, and I only slept two hours for about eight weeks. But that's what it took to get ahead, to build the biggest brand and, and to make it happen. So when you lead from the front, and you're communicating with everyone and talking to everyone. My guys around the world didn't even know there was COVID. They earned more money. I said, spend time with your family. We got the stock out and we communicated. So COVID has allowed you to become, to communicate, as you said, and health is the new world. I told my people, if you can walk for an hour between six and seven in South Africa, which was the half this lockdown, set your alarm clock for half past five and do that hour's exercise. Otherwise, the whole day you're going to complain. It's lockdown, it's this. So you know the environment. We planned around the environment. And thank God we were blessed. And I became number one on Amazon, the fastest growing business. When a lot of my staff, even my financial director said, Barry, close down. What are you doing this for? So I said, sometimes in life, it's not all about money. So I probably saved 100,000 lives in America. No one's going to remember me what car I bought or, or, or how many million customers I get a month. I want to be remembered for all the good that I did in the world. And I don't need profit. I just want to tick every box. The profit will come and the profit I share. And in business, people now, the whole world, some of the biggest mobile operators, I innovate and they imitate. But people will always buy from the ones that innovate or the people that are the pulse of the market. In the community that is my message we didn't make money of the community no one of my office was allowed to go home until every single ppe item for that day for the day was packed and i was packing them i'm not better than the 14 dollar guy storeroom i will lead from the front i was the first one to pack i was the last one to pack even with my ceo afterward when my family was calling and i hadn't seen my kids i went to the post office when we had excess stuff and the truck came at six. I was there many times at nine o'clock at night. And, 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 and how you navigate it is you just do that a little bit extra. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's wise words and especially leading from the front. I mean, it's one thing telling people what to do and then not, not actually taking ownership and leadership around it. Um, very difficult to, to motivate and galvanize people and staff around it. And, you know, unless they're actually seeing what you're doing. But again, you know, the, the theme around purpose-led and doing the right thing at the time um, may not seem like a profitable decision right now, but certainly in the long term, starts does materialize into, into profits. Um, and 
you know, seeing some brands and companies making the decision to invest in communities over the period of COVID when things were really tough and hard and, you know, sacrificing profits now have started to see profits later because they've built that brand loyalty and a much deeper connection with their customers um, over the period. Um, you know, Barry, what, what comes out for me a lot is your passion and, and tenacity um, in business and the mere fact that you are sole owner of your business um, and, and managing something of, of such a size. This is a two-part question really for you around how do you, what was your decision around wanting to keep ownership, so being a sole owner of your business um, when a lot of businesses, when they start growing and getting to the size that, you, that yours is at, have a board of directors, have shareholders, et cetera. Yet you've taken the decision to, to, to remain um, independent in that respect. Um, and then kind of bolted onto that, what have been some of your experience, what have been some of your challenges that you've experienced and, and really how have you overcome them? Okay. So the first thing is I tell people, back yourself. So I took money out of my bond. It was a third of the value. And I tell people, become an entrepreneur. So if I got it wrong, I wouldn't have lost my house. I would have got a job earning the same amount of money elsewhere. So why I never went there and I didn't buy companies and I didn't take on debt because short-term gain is long-term pain. So every one of you that has a shareholder there, if you had played it right and you backed your said, you get very bitter. Because if there's six shareholders, there's six different directions. Some person wants the money now. Someone wants it for their college education. You can't make a decision and you can't make a decision very, very quickly. So the reason why I went that route, it was I had time, I have patience, and now I have the whole world wanting to do deals with me. It's because I built, by being a sole shareholder, it took longer and slower, but I built the deepest foundation before I built the 100 story building. You know, I used to do the deliveries myself. I used to do that, that, that phone and say, can I speak to the marketing department? I go, Barry speaking. And then they say, can I speak to finance? I'd say, Barry speaking. And, and then I said, uh, can I speak to the guy in the storeroom? Barry speaking. So I learned every aspect of the business because I had to learn every aspect. And as you see that video, that video is how I operate. That is a reflection of my personality. I do do deals in less than 30 seconds because I back my gut, it's my money. And I'm saying, I don't have to report to anyone. I don't get it right 10 out of 10 times. If I told you I'd be lying, I get it right seven or eight out of 10 times. But most people get it right three out of four times. And then they need more money from their shareholders. So I've already sold the same goods seven times. Like I can do seven deals in 10 minutes, which I did today. My competitors need a board of directors. They need a bank. They need a cash flow. They need a plan. I'll give you a story. During COVID, uh, a Somalian reached out to me. Um, and he said to me, Barry, I need 2 million rand from you. I need free packs. I need free vehicles. And I can start tomorrow. So I listened to the guy. And I never met the guy. I wasn't in a room with him. But... But I'm saying your gut, I always say back your gut. Your gut is always right. If when you're doing a deal and your gut is not right and you don't feel the right energy with the person, don't do the deal, walk away. Now this person is a Somalian. I invested, whatever I promised him, I actually gave him more. So he said to me, Barry, and I couldn't travel to South Africa. I was pre-green card and, 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 and people were taking my dealers, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Everyone was was going mad. He said, why would you invest with me? You've never met me. So my answer to him was, why wouldn't I? What have I got to lose? It, it, it's your name at stake. And if, if you catch me, well, then you, it's short term game. But what I'm going to do, if I can give you this money, and I've never met you before, I've empowered the entire Somalian community around South Africa. That Somalian is going to get me a license in Somalia, in Kenya, in there. So it was just doing good. And that money was a large sum of money, but it wasn't money that I needed because I wasn't living here. I didn't have lifestyle and I was ahead of the curve. So that guy has now employed 350 unemployed people in Somalia. That's what that money has allowed. I don't need another house. I don't need to fly business class or first class or a plane or whatever. 
I need to empower people. So good karma comes back times 10. That investment has come up times 10. That guy is my marketing guy. So any Somalian that wants to buy starter packs, they buy it from Big Boss Barry. Barry invested, and that was my marketing. So when I said to you the other day, I, everything I built, I've never spent a cent on marketing because I don't have to. You know, that same Somalian said to me, Barry, when I come to your office, there's no one there. I don't get coffee. I go to my competitor, I get free coffee, but they charge me somewhere else. You, you don't have people, you don't have middlemen, you don't have ego, you don't have fancy buildings, you just have plain Barry, the naked truth. What you see is what you get. He said, you've empowered me. You've inspired me. You've allowed me to buy the Rolls Royce of coffee machines. I can make coffee. You've taught me how to fish. You've spent time with me. You weren't here, but you showed me to go to Shoss and Goovy. You told me to go to Volcom. You told me to go to Heilbrot. You told me to go to Perez. You told me to hand out some cards at the ATM because they have money. You invested in me, and now I'm going to be your biggest dealer. So that is the story, and it will lead on to my book later. It's not about Barry. It's about inspiring those people. So when the guy told me, uh, I had a Zoom call with him two days ago, just, just after I left South Africa, he said, Barry, I've managed to send, with your promotion, 37 family members, $100. That's going to feed 37 families. I mean, $100 is 1,500 Rand. I got personal messages from all 37 people that Big Boss Barry fed them. And my response to the Somalian was, no, I didn't feed them. You fed them. I just gave you the tools. So the more I give, the more I get. So for business, you got to give and to get. To answer the second part of your question, it just took me longer. No one wants to deal with a one-man show. There's no credibility. Will you be here next year? Will you be here next week? Uh, I don't see fancy offices. I don't see cars in, the, in, in your driveway. You've got a little house in Bramley Park. How do I know you're not hit and run? And, and, and I'm in shorts, like I am now, in T-shirts and slip slops. And I do the same thing when I meet my customers. I never, ever in an office, which is my advice to people, don't be in an office. Because work in your business, sorry, work on your business, not in your business, because you become a psychologist. The whole day, I'm, all I'm thinking about, and my kid said to me today, Dad, you're in your own world for 20 minutes. I said, that 20 minutes, just I worked out the answer, how to take over the world. And what I'm saying is the best thing to do is eventually, you know, people will lie about you, competitors will lie about you. But being nimble, being small, being humble, allows you to get the entire market, you know? So where it was, I used adversity into opportunity. So every time they would say to me, you're not going to be around, I grew 10%. Then they said, you can't do it. So I did it. It was just like doing the New York Marathon twice and, and playing for my country and uh, rugby at, at, at 34 after like 20 operations. When people tell me I can't do it, then I'm inspired, like I've inspired the communities. I go out and do it. Failure is not a word. No one in my company is allowed to say I can't or no. Those two words don't exist. I will tell people, find a way. If you can't do it, I will guide you. So that mantra and that thing has allowed me to, to probably become the biggest in South Africa. And, and I'm putting together the dream team. It's like, you know, the saying, birds of a feather flock together. And when people resonate with your message and, and how you do business, you have no competition. So when my customers talk about competition, I say, stop. When you worry about your neighbor's lawn, you grow weeds. We have no competition. We do everything in our power to do everything right. And the profit flows like the River Nile. And, I, and sometimes rivers are dry for three months. They dry for four months. I've invested millions and millions and I've gone out at cost to empower these people because it's COVID. Now, I've got a flash flood with the river now. It's one thing leads to another. I'm now getting phones from America. I have Apple calling me. I have Samsung calling me. I've, put the, I've taken the worldwide experts around the world. And, and, and there's a story of when I worked at a company, there was a guy that dropped off stock. 
he's now my, he's now my head of Africa. Uh, his name's Rob Sinti, and he was just nice to me. So when I was choosing between three candidates for the position, the wheel is round. So what I'm saying in business, wheel is round. Make sure you're always kind to everyone and good to everyone. I chose him because he was kind. He asked me about my family. So when you're doing business, when I have a dinner meeting, for three hours, we talk rubbish. We talk about girls. We talk about 1974. We talk about getting drunk. There's a human element. And then at the end, for the last two minutes, we do the deal. Generally, it's 30 seconds, and my record is three. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough record to beat. <laughs> but, um, I think um, I really love that. You know, what came up for me was around um, having that speed to market, being a sole owner, and really being able to sidestep and move forward quickly compared to the other big corporates that are out there and those that have the board of directors. I mean, there, there certainly are those, those, those um, advantages around it. I um, also really like the idea of being transparent. I think it's also, you know, a lot of vulnerability comes through in being transparent too with customers and, and, your, and your consumers. Um, and I think it also makes it very accessible and, and, and um, that relationship very tangible by being transparent and, and also having that vulnerability. Um, around it, um, but you you built this you know you built this incredible business here in, in in South Africa, and you made the decision then to go global, um, and I believe you you're also the diamond sponsor of the prepaid show in Las Vegas. What made you decide to to go global, um, and and tell us a little bit more around your US plans. Okay, so just to finish off the, the earlier question, which, which I left out, it's a classic case of an oil tanker versus a tugboat. An oil tanker is powerful. It can take thousands and thousands of containers. But as we saw in the Suez Canal, who came to save them? A tugboat. So my business is a tugboat. And that's how being lean has allowed me to, to go to America. So in 2018, at the top of my game in December, I uprooted my family, three young kids, to, to Irvine. And everyone said to me in, in, uh, in South Africa, Barry, I heard thousands of rumors. Why are you leaving? What are you running away from? You're at the top of your game. So I always remember rugby terminologies, Bobby Skinstead. He played one season too many, then one season too few. But I went away to learn. I went away to grow. I mean, I did three years at the Cape Technicon and that was it. I wanted to do my PhD and my MBA in the mobile market. The only way you grow is by learning. So I went to test myself in the hardest market in the world, but it's also the biggest market. I mean, there was a deal the other day for $8 billion in prepaid. Now, that is something that I'm going to do in my sleep because... There's no one else that is empowered the community. I have every Somalian, every Nigerian, every Ghana in America. So my plans were, and, and I did it the same way here. I stood outside Walmart, 39 Saturdays in a row, because that was my market research. I learned to speak Spanish, um, just like I know a few words in, in, in Arabic. Uh, the first word I word, learned was no. <laughs> so... Uh, that has allowed me to, to do the fundamentals. And I've only worked with the, the NVNOs, which is the mobile virtual networks. I was going to do an NVNO myself. And then I realized I'm the best in the world at distribution. I'm not a network. So America taught me to do one thing and do one thing better in the world. So my plans for America, there was a guy, Shane Lockoff, and I'm sure he's listening. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll catch a run or a swim or a cycle. Uh, later today. He, he's in Boca. He helped me find my house here. And uh, he was the worldwide expert in phones. Um, he started 3G. Um, he sold it for 1.9 billion in Africa. So when you see my, my video, it, it was me putting the plans and the dream team together. We are the Uber. We are the Airbnb. So you can work out the valuations of Uber and Airbnb on the Wall Street Stock Exchange, which as a little boy, I always dreamed of ringing the bill. So I have a bill at home and every week I ring the bill 
because hopefully in the next 12 to 14 months, I can ring the bill. And I promised all my customers who are going to come from South Africa to America, to Las Vegas, we're going to teach America where there's 400 million people, where so many people have lost their jobs. I'm going to teach them direct distribution. I'm going to take my skill set, my technology, my way, my route to market, my story, my launching a book. We're going to choose either one or three or four of the mobile operators. And we're going to, we're going to achieve 25 million customers in three to five years. We're going to empower all the unemployed. We're going to give them hope. We're going to give, because hope is, we we're talking earlier is a better thing. And it's just copy, cut, and paste. And, and, and my aim is to leave a, a legacy. Always remember where you started. It's a lot easier empowering and giving it away in dollars than rands. So I went to America and I moved for, because of the lockdown. I couldn't come to South Africa, to, to Boca and Florida. So I uprooted my family for a second time. But I was there during PPE and COVID and we got all the brand and we got all the tools and we know the right people to hire. And so many people from South Africa, I'm going to move over. Uh, I'm going to try to do deals with the government where I can take three, 400 entrepreneurs from South Africa on exchange program. So I am going to build the biggest prepaid, which I'm building and handset business in the world because I've assembled the dream team. And as I said earlier, birds of a feather flock together. So Shane's been in retirement for four years in Boca. You don't meet by chance and you don't meet for a season. You meet for a reason. So Shane was a flower seller from Hilbra. I was a storeman from Constantia. We're building this business as equal partners to go tell the story for future generations how a flower seller and a storeman created wealth, which will far exceed our lifespan. It will, this wealth and the funds, and we're doing all the right things, and we don't need money, and we're probably not even going to take salaries. We'll get shares or, or whatever we do. We'll list it on the stock exchange. We'll buy a few JSE companies. That is the plan. So we want to leave a legacy for hundreds, like I've got 25,000 people here at a time. I want to create jobs for two, 300,000 people. Like a lot of the informal migrants, they call me the Messiah. So I'm not the Messiah. I just am the holder of a contract. And it could be at and It could be Verizon. It could be T-Mobile. It could be all of them. Or it could be none of them. But I'm going to bring all the technologies and take all the South Africans to America because once you have credibility. So I'm made in Africa. I'm matured in America, matured in America and I'm sold to the rest of the world. So that is what the trailblazers do. I went there for future generations of Tate's family members. My phone didn't ring. Barry who? You did what? I've shaken a guy's hand and my watch has fallen off. And in a joking way, I tell people when they ask me about Americans, they have soul. Also, that's what I've dealt with to get ahead. So I was a trailblazer. I had no ego. I just had soul. And now I'm going to tell my story. And, you know, I've been the salesman. I've done the 20 hours. Now it's time to go break bread with people. So when you do business, and I've said it before, I will not do business with someone that I haven't broken bread. Because when they look me in the eye, they look me in the eye. When they look to my left or to my right, and there's no gaps. There's a gap in an email. There's a gap in a WhatsApp. When you sit face to face and you look someone in the eye, there's no gap. So when I was on the call with a Somalian and he zoomed me in, his eyes never left my eyes. This guy was the real deal. And what's amazing is he wants to be president in Somalia in 10 years' time. And I'm already starting to look at investing in properties, in telco stuff there. Everything I do around the world is linked to America. Now what I'm going to do in South Africa, I'm going to buy all the mobile devices, myself and Shane. We're going to sell it to the networks. We're going to give the customers who are going through hard times, who don't want to be on postpaid and have a bill every month. We're going to give them the Rolls Royce of refurb phones. And I've been to every factory in America, I think. And we're going to give it to them at the price of a Mazda. So when you give people value and you empower them and you don't rip them off, they'll have more money for data because they, they won't have a fancy bill at the end of the month. So with the mobile operators and the leverage that Shane has and myself, so when you pair the prepaid expert and the phone expert, you have a company that's worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars 
on Wall Street and I will have foundations and Shane will have foundations and everything we make, we give back because you've got to give in this world to receive. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. There's sure. It's, um, you know, it's, it's been an inspiring journey that, that I think that you, you know, that you've taken us on, that you had yourself. Um, or so certainly, you know, without, you know, growth doesn't come without any kind of pain and suffering and, and challenges. And um, I think through your journey from, from what I've experienced, what you've shared with, with me and, and with everyone else, you know, there's, there's been a lot of growth, a lot of learning. I love the themes that have been coming out around just no excuses. And it's, you know, it's very, very simple. I, I get to feel that, you know, the way that the business, your, you conduct business is a very simple principled kind of foundation. There's no excuses. Make sure that you plan. Make sure there's a structured day. Break bread with, with people. Have that empathetic side. Drive with, lead with purpose and profit will follow. Um, and, um, and back yourself, you know, have faith in yourself, back yourself, listen to your gut, um, trust yourself and, and, and work towards leaving a legacy um, and, and helping others. Um, and, and I can imagine with, with everything that has been going on with the last, you know, with the number of years, You've probably got a lot of stories to share as part of that journey as well. A lot of fun stories, a lot of sad stories. Um, and I imagine we would hear and, and read a lot about that in your book. Perhaps can you tell us a little bit as, as my final question, um, what we could expect in the book? Sure. So when I was deciding to write a book, I don't know if you can see this. It's called Winning the Unfair Fight. How Your Small Business Can Take On and Beat the Giants by Sam Hazelden. This book was one of the best books I've ever read in my life. This book will inspire me. This guy's story is like the difference between a spaza shop and a wholesaler of what I had to do. That was the most inspiring book I've ever read in my life. It talks about a David taking out Goliath. When I won the the Absa Jewish Achievers Award, uh, the one person, Vanessa, I think she's even on this call. She penciled me the name as, as David, because David took out Goliath. And, and, and from those four years, uh, I think I won four years ago, I don't even know, uh, it's not really important. It taught me as David to always outsmart everyone. No one must ever know your next move. So, I've been blessed. I've been, I've been born with the luck. I was telling you guys earlier, my dad died at four, uh, number three or four brothers. We didn't have food at home. Uh, Brenda will probably remember at school, I had broken uniforms. And, and why I'm telling the story is I could blame the world or I could change the world. I could have landed up in an orphanage, but through initially sport, I trained harder. I'm not the most talented. Like, like a lot of people, I'm not the fittest, I'm not the strongest, I'm far from the leanest, but I will out-train you, I will out-work you, I will out-smart you, I will work seven days a week. No, I say business, success doesn't work business hours. I will be up four hours after you, but I'm doing it for all the right reasons. So I've written this book and... Uh, I think there's actually another chapter coming, so we might delay it a bit, we might not. I don't know. This book is about giving back to the people that built this business for me, like I said earlier. I want to tell my story. Like, most people don't know my story. The pain and suffering. I got a termination letter from Cell C in July while I was saving millions of people's lives. I want to tell the story why I got the letter and how... I lost another thing. And, I own, and when people say they've lost three quarters of their business, I lost three quarters of my business. But I had one thing, I had Vodacom. And Vodacom were prepared to back me. So when I was in a corner and people were losing their mind all over the world, and I had one quarter of my business left, I was in a foreign country. I decided then and there, I could either give up, I could blame the other people, or I could make it work from, six, from a 10-hour time zone. So I moved to a seven-hour time zone. I planned my day to wake up at two o'clock in the morning so I could phone Vodacom in December. Are there any starter packs? I planned for the shortages. I planned for the lockdown. When they told me the price was nine rand or seven rand and it was normally two rand, I grabbed it. It's the golden rule in life. 
He who has the gold makes the rule. So my book is not about competitors because I don't have any, because I do all the right thing. My book is about telling the story, the real story. It's my story. How every no, and I got thousands of no's, and every no, which was going to be the title of my book, every no, I tell people, is one step closer to a yes. I love it when people tell me no. It excites me because I know if I have 12 meetings in a day, someone will say yes. It's a numbers game. And when the message is there and positive, never, ever, ever give up. I've had 52 operations. I've played sport. I was told in 2009, which is a lot of the things that I talk about in my book. Barry, you've got 150 staples in each leg. I lost my mom in, in, in two, like a week after I came out of hospital. She wanted to see my daughter. And then it was time to go on. And she said to me like a last words, whatever you do in this world, just do it with the right reason honesty, integrity. Like I always say, it's never going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. And the sun will come up tomorrow. That is my message for everyone. We have dark days. We have light days. Thing. The sun always comes up tomorrow. Tomorrow, you always have a chance to, to tell the story. My book about is about telling the story about the, the, the Muhammads, the Abduls, the Farooks, the Khalids, the Tariqs, that they, I invested in them and they invested in me. And that's the story. Like people came to my house. I went to go work in Vilcom while I was here. I went to Kimberley. I went to Uppington. I was up at four o'clock in the morning. I took flights. So this is about inspiring the world, giving them hope and showing that against all the odds that I took out Goliath around the world, I had the biggest companies trying to buy me out and I'm never going to sell. I don't need money. I do it all for the right reasons. And what I tell people, and, and, and this is where some people get it wrong. It's not about how much you make. I love making money, but I get 10 times more satisfaction of giving it away, which will lead to, to, my, next, to, to my next question that uh, I've got something exciting to tell you. So I carry on and then I'll give you the exciting news before we open it up to the floor. Well, on that note, we, we are coming to the end of the time allocation. So my, I suppose my last question is, what do you have something exciting to tell us? Yes. So uh, I was saying Brenna was at school uh, with me and I saw a, 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 a checkers and I think she does an amazing job. Uh, Susan, who was on earlier, employed me, was my first employee at Canon. I think that deal was done in three seconds because... When I said, hi, I'm Barry, she said, when can you start? So these are all old friends. So old friends are new friends. I, I met Lisa. I've heard a story about living in America. We've connected. I want to take you guys all out for dinner uh, when I get back to, to South Africa. And eight, I'm a very numbers person. I mean, most people tell me I'm not good with numbers, but I'm great with figures. We'll just leave it at that. So 18, Jewish organization, Chai. Um, I said the other day I'd give a hundred rand for when I posted about my book. So I will ask everyone here and their friends to post so we can get this message around the world. I'm giving you guys 18,000 rand uh, and Brenna will send me the bank details tomorrow just to kickstart the, the All Jet Cape Town initiative. So you are able to empower and do some good with the money. I'm from Cape Town. I've been blessed. I don't forget my old friends. And everything happens for a reason, not a season. So what I do, I mean, I'll probably share this on LinkedIn and YouTube and it'll go around the world. I will challenge everyone to my 18,000 to match and better. So this 18,000 is once off. Plus every year for all the good you do, every year in January, I'll send you a check. It's $1,000 or $1,200 and 18 is high. You will get 18,000 Rand from me for as long as I'm in business. So... Thank you for the opportunity. You know, I don't really speak that often because I always say less is more. I'd rather prefer people. But sometimes in a time of COVID, you got to speak, you got to give away your secrets. So my book is all about my secrets because I've mentored people. They've tried to copy me. They've tried hard, they'll fail. So I just tell people, just do good. So hopefully that good will get you more money. I mean, charity organizations do great jobs. So Brenna, Send me your, your details and you'll get the wire tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. 
Barry, thank you. I mean, that's really unbelievably generous of you. We are so grateful for um, that very generous donation and um, really having this, this hour with you one-on-one, -on -one, which has truly been um, awesome and uh, incredibly beneficial to hear how hard you've worked, the resilience you've shown, the, and the inspiring and um, hopeful message that you've shared with all of us. But there is one question I want to ask you, if you don't mind. The greatest when you do sleep at night, which, when you do sleep at night, which I realize is not that much, but when you are actually asleep, what keeps you up at night? So that is a very interesting question. And, and I tell people, when you build your business with integrity and honesty, and done all the right things and empowered people. And you look at yourself and generally before you go to bed at night, you look at yourself in the mirror. Nothing keeps me up at night. I can go to bed early. I can go to bed late. It's uh, nothing, no, nothing keeps me awake. So when I, so when I sleep, I sleep peacefully. Um, just another challenge I have. So why I don't like sleeping is I have a sleep apnea machine. But I don't blame the world. I deal with it. So I have the Rolls Royce of sleep apnea machines. It's automatically. So I sleep better than when I didn't have the machine. I only got the machine 15 years ago. So God only gives to those people and the tenacity. God only gives to those people. I tell people when I talk, they can handle things. So I don't like sleeping. That's why I don't sleep because it's uncomfortable putting on a mask and stuff like that. But when I hit the sack, I dream and I only dream about the next day and helping people and that. So four hours is like eight hours or six hours is, is like that. So nothing keeps me awake at night. I'm so excited. When I wake up the next day, it's like I have a saying, and, and just, just to end off once, I was once hijacked. I had a nine mil down my head. Um, the guy's balaclava fell off and they said, pull the trigger. And my calmness saved me because I said to the guy, he had my Vodacom rugby tickets for the box. I said, sir, can I please get my rugby tickets back? So all of them laughed. The guy put his gun away. He said, yeah, I don't think they're going to let us into the rugby. So it's a level of calmness. And from that day, this is a story that, you know, a lot of people have lost businesses. There's been divorces. There's been crime. What I'm saying is I want to leave you with one message. We all have two lives. Our second life starts when we realize we only have one. So you only have your name once. Don't do anything that's going to regret. You're going to regret for the, for the rest of your life. Because if you're not a doctor and a lawyer, you're not going to have clients. So enjoy your life. We have, I told you the story of $100 Somalia. We all earn more than $100. We don't need that fancy supper at La Perla or Giovanni's or that steak or whatever. Rather spend some time going to the township instead of having a, so that money I would have spent buying my kids clothes or whatever, rather spend that and give it to good causes because we're not short of anything. We only need the basic human rights. We need clothes and we need food. We don't need steak. So what my message of hope is, it can be done. Never give up. And, and, and when you do everything right, you sleep at night. I sleep like a baby. So I put my head down and Good. I sleep. Thank you. I know we we at, at the end of our time, but I just wanted to know if there was one or two questions from the audience. Um, you can either unmute yourself I'd like or... To, I'd like to ask you a question. My Thanks, speech. Stephen. Go ahead. Yeah, so first of all, Barry, um, geez, I've followed your career for a while now and it's massively impressive. So well done. Thank you. Um, just Thank you, yeah. Well done, but just a, a few questions. So firstly, why the, the, the name Last Man Standing for your book? Yeah. Um, I guess that's one of them. And then I, I remember it used to be called Blue, something Blue Telecoms to Blue Beach. What was the, the name change there? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer the second question and then I'll answer the first question afterwards. So my company was called Blue Cellular. Blue Cellular, um, okay. Yeah. I've always had insight to be ahead of the market. So I always wanted to go online because that complemented my 
You know, when the network deals with one person, they want to do with one person, they can do everything. So cellular is a South African term um, and mobile is overseas. So we were getting a brand that was at the pulse of innovation, like digits, everyone's going digital, everyone's going online. Like, I think we did something when we sold something at the click of a mouse, we can deliver to your house. Don't go to the store, let it arrive at your door. So we realized people need stuff quickly and with COVID. So I was ahead of my game. So Blue Beat Digital came from similar to, and don't tell anyone, Beats by Dre, BBD. So Blue Beat Digital, it was a brand that the whole world would aspire to. And that's why... I tell people, in order to evolve, you need to grow. So what I've done in America in the last two and a half years, the technologies, the different angle, it's like when Victor Matfield and, and Percy Montgomery came back to South Africa, they knew what to do. They had survived. They had a new skill set. I've done my PhD in, in prepaid. I've got 40 different technologies that I'm going to bring here. I've got the entire community. So why I've gone out with a the title last man standing is because what i'm going to do to the market how i'm going to inspire the people and the community i have no competition no one stands a chance because i'm doing it for all the right reasons so i believe everything i put out to the universe everyone calls me the oracle i believe we've done everything right some of my competitors i think maybe haven't done what i've done and, and last man standing is when everything gets changed and, and the networks start operating with people that that share their message, no one has a chance. So I'm very lean. I'm very mean. I'm coming back to, well, I was in South Africa now I've gone. I've come back to get my market share. Some people did some very not so clever things. And the uh, last man standing is I, I started with nothing. I've got all the right people, I have all the communities. No one can compete with me. Sure. I get less sure. and I give more away. So I make a little bit of money. So, so Last Man Standing, I find, is a very fitting title. Yeah. So a lot of us would obviously like to go live in America, or certainly I would. But you know, if you've, it sounds like you're doing amazingly there, so maybe I'll ping you for a job. But secondly, and secondly is, why do you still concentrate on South Africa if, if you're doing so well in America? Okay, so very good question. So all my customers have cousins, brothers, sisters, aunties, aunties and uncles in America. If you run away, like I went away, I lost a lot of business. The day I rocked up and I broke bread and I smiled. So you got to remember your roots. So what I do here and what I do with direct to market, you know, the world, the world is like one place now. You know, everyone's online, everyone's on social media. It's, you have to have a legacy in order to, in order to go to, you know, like when you're playing baseball, not that baseball, but normally baseball. In order to get a home run, you've got to go from first base, second base, third base, and fourth base. You've got to have a story. So I'm actually set, when I left, I didn't set up the right team. Now I've set up the right team and it's a lesson for business. You can't be in two places at once. So that was one of my failures. I thought I was He-Man. I was only Barry and I got sick. So my focus is America, but I had to come back. I had to regather the troops. I, I had to lead from the front. There was a video of me in my jocks, in, in my Hugo Boss shorts, that even my own brother in Australia asked me if I was on drugs. But that's what it took. It's going the extra thing. Like We've got skin in the game. So I was in my jocks. I'm the only group CEO around the world, nothing to hide, skin in the game. It was like I arrived at, at Clifton on the beach at nine o'clock at night because we, we had a campaign that if you swim with sharks, make sure you have the appetite of a whale. So that was me looking like a whale. I had had a kitka, a khala, and four liters of water. And, and the next thing, the next video you'll see, you'll see I've lost 12 kilos of body fat and put on about six kilos of muscle. I want to show the message how with hope and getting your mind and your body right, nothing is impossible. So the next video will be coming out of the water like James Bond, uh, not being in my jocks. You'll see me swimming. You'll see I'm twice the size that I was. Then I put on a suit. 
then it becomes like a Donald Trump moment where everyone in America thought I ran away to help the people in Africa. But America is the end game. My kids are in the system. So your legacy is get one thing right and then move on to the next one. Thanks, man. Well, Barry, thank you so much. I'd also like to thank Daniel for facilitating the conversation and um, doing an awesome job. Thanks, Daniel. We really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. Evening, I hope you've all gained from, from Barry's message. And uh, lastly, to, to Barry, thank you. It's been awesome. And we just really appreciate the generosity of, of your message and, uh, and the generosity of your incredible donation. Thank you so much. Thank it's you, Barry. Thank you for your time tonight as well. Yeah, so I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to share my message. Um, if you want to do a follow up in a few months time or you want to just do where people ask questions and I can give them hope and I can give them guidance on a forum and everyone can do it. Most of the time when I talk once, they ask me to talk a second or third time. It would be my greatest pleasure to help the people of Cape Town and everything that Orchard stands for, I stand for. So uh, by this time tomorrow, you'll be famous for being famous. So. Thank I'll, you. I'll, Thank you I'll, so, so much. I will show you what the power of being an influencer, what I learned in America and social media, how the right message can get to the right people. And when I share this message and I ask for donations, Brenna, make sure your phone is fully charged because everyone wants to support Africa, but they don't know where to start. So exciting times ahead. Thank you. We look awesome. forward to it. <laughs> Bye, Absolutely. everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care. Cool. Bye. Ciao.